The dream splits its pod in the silence. My father is standing one midsummer in the park, surrounded by deer, a doe, and three fawns. And he is reaching up on tiptoe, his right arm grasping into the lucid liquid shimmer of the lime leaves, pulling down young sprays in threshes of green for the deer to eat. One fawn's furred antlers are adorned with leaf, and its neck longs for him. Eyes of deep marvel, the flank a constellation of stippled white. From where I stand, it seems to swim through the mirage, my father at the center, and even the memory is a picture held on a pool, these souls alive in it, lush in the water. I stretch my hand to reach him, and they unshoal a lost image, a dispersal. A gurgled note, high and bubbling, the moorhen busy with her nest, shimmying into the pond wearing her mask, the red petal of the shield daubed over the skull, Aurelian armor of the beak tip. And then I see them. Brown, speckled eggs in the intervals of reed light, leaf chartreuse, and the nest reflected in the water, perched on constant motion. We cannot know the truth of water before we know its touch, its break, the tendrils of sun regathering, never a stillness, the sky split from water, the nest from the image of the nest, and the bird sliding across picking twigs, an aerial shadow over the bed of the pond. It is only where the darkness travels that we picture depth, the silt, and the truth of it. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each episode I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Two Reflections by Sean Hewitt. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. I would give all my poems to have my father back. These are the words that the poet Sean Hewitt wrote in his small article for the Irish Times in 2020. Unless it's experienced, the depth of grief caused by the loss of a parent is near impossible to fathom. Yet with that one sentence, Hewitt makes it clear that there is no price he wouldn't pay for more time with his father. He goes on to say that, unfortunately, the day he lost his father is the same day he signed his deal to publish Tongues of Fire, the collection from which this poem is taken. The tone of two reflections matches that of the rest of Tongues of Fire. Hewitt paints a vibrant yet haunting portrayal of the natural world, one that he uses as a lens through which to investigate things like death, sexuality, connection, and hope. This use of the natural world as an investigative tool is something the old romantic poets were well known for. It is no surprise then that Hewitt, a self-admitted fan of the romantics, has chosen to follow in their footsteps. To say that he merely follows in their footsteps, however, would do him a great disservice. Throughout his collection, Hewitt tackles complex themes with an unflinching sincerity. Sex, memory, decay, rebirth, and much more all fuse together in a sequence of poetry that seems almost alive. Readers, myself included, feel themselves situated in the same damp, constantly night-blanketed landscapes that Hewitt describes. It's no surprise, then, that the collection has taken the literary world somewhat by storm. The reason that I've chosen this poem from the myriad of excellent poems in the book is because I feel that it showcases just what Hewitt does so well. It is a distillation of all his skill, from his deep knowledge of poetic tradition to his deaf talent for evoking emotion through searing imagery. It is all exemplified in two reflections. One thing it does a little more than many of the others, however, is hope. As the title might suggest, 
the poem has been split into two sections by the poet. The first of these is a specific and touching elegy for his father. The second section is more an examination of the mystery of death and rebirth. The subject matter of the poem is made very clear in the opening lines of the first section I've chosen to analyze. The dream splits its pod in the silence. My father is standing one midsummer in the park, surrounded by deer, a doe, and three fawns. And he is reaching up on tiptoe, his right arm grasping into the lucid liquid shimmer of the lime leaves, pulling down young sprays in threshes of green for the deer to eat. One fawn's furred antlers are adorned with leaf, and its neck longs for him. Eyes of deep marble, the flank a constellation of stippled white. It mimics the sprouting of a seed, and so, from the very beginning, the idea of birth and renewal is established. There is a fusion of reality and dream that is made very clear from the strange imagery we are presented with. The poet's father is placed at the center of nature. He mentions that it's one midsummer. And for me, this is a reference to one of Shakespeare's most famous plays, A Midsummer Night's Dream. It is a drama famous for its liminal quality, set in a world that follows the fantastical rules of dream logic, where nature and the bizarre are joined seamlessly. The slight reference in this poem makes it clear to Hewitt's reader that what they are about to experience is a moment where the normal rules do not apply. The magic of this section is in the way that his father's character shines through in Hewitt's choice of imagery. His father is engaged in the action of the caregiver. He is reaching up on tiptoe, his right arm grasping into the lucid liquid shimmer to pull down food for the deer around him. The doe and three fawns that are around him are a symbol for a family unit and one that possibly acts as a stand-in for Hewitt's own. In pulling down those great threshes of food, he is literally providing for them. We see the sheer admiration in the eye of one fawn, and it is possibly a telling sign as to how Hewitt viewed his father, one of the animals craning their neck just to be near him. The longing takes on a much deeper and more poignant meaning when it's a son longing for his deceased father, as opposed to a deer merely leaning for food. The natural world seems abundant here and is in perfect harmony with the father's nurturing instinct. As elegies for lost loved ones go, this is a beautiful tribute. It's unclear to us exactly what is unfolding here. Is it a dream or memory? Why not both? Hewitt is embracing his childhood perspective of his father and what results is a kind of mythologizing of the man. He becomes a Pan-like figure the Greek god of the wild and a key literary figure in both the Romantic and Victorian movements. This kind of mythologizing of parents is not uncommon in contemporary poetry. It is a fundamental way of understanding our parents' roles in our lives, especially the tightness form it took when we were younger. From that final image of the dappled flank, the dreamlike quality of the poem takes over and leads us through the next section. From where I stand, it seems to swim through the mirage, my father at the center, and even the memory is a picture held on a pool. These souls alive in it, lush in water. I stretch my hand to reach him, and they unshoal, a lost image, a dispersal. I've previously mentioned the modern conventions of this poem, but that's not to say that it's completely modern through and through. The poet's use of first-person language, like from where I stand and I stretch out my hand, placed the poem firmly in lyric territory. As I've explained in earlier episodes of this podcast, a lyric poem is one that shares the inner world of the poet with their audience. It is another nod to Hewitt's romantic inspirations and admittedly, a little rarer in poetry these days. This poem, and the rest of Tongues of Fire, detailing all facets of Hewitt. He admitted that his choice of lyric poetry is something that many might find unfashionable. However, in explaining his choice, Hewitt wrote, The lyric poem, its patterning, its rhyme, its insistent eye, 
has for me a beauty that is perhaps unfashionable and might seem to make it isolated from the political imperative. But it is my wager that in speaking of ourselves, we will find readers who share something of that emotion, that experience, that flash of strange perspective. In other words, it is my contention that no poem is ever isolated if it is done right. That insistent I dominates the section and helps to reinforce the yearning as we hear a first-hand account of it and so relate it to our own and feel it like Hewitt might. The fading of memory is also examined here. Hewitt uses the analogy that memory is held on a pool. He sets about perfectly describing the difficulty of zoning in on a memory, attempting to stretch my hand and reach him, only to have it disperse like ripples on the surface. There is more wonderful natural imagery at play, as the souls of the pond of memory become lush in water. These memories become fish here, all pooled together, suddenly unshoaling, as the poet attempts to see them better, or interact with them. The ever-shifting quality of water seems a perfect choice for the frustration of how our memories dissipate over time. There is a desperation to this idea, that something might be beyond our grasp. This urgency is only sharpened by the grief that Hewitt is feeling. So effective is this comparison of water and memory that it becomes the link between the first and second parts of the poem. A gurgled note, high and bubbling, the moorhen busy with her nest, shimmying into the pond, wearing her mask, the red petal of the shield daubed over the skull, aureolan armour of the beak tip, and then I see them, brown speckled eggs in the intervals of reed light, leaf chartreuse, and the nest reflected in the water, perched on constant motion. The focus on his father is abandoned in this second part, and the natural world, in its various states of renewal, are brought back to the fore. The gurgled note carries us gently into this section, mimicking the sound of water from the previous. The image of the moorhen is introduced, a common duck sighted in Britain and Ireland. Again, references to parenting and home are evoked in the moorhen, busy with her nest. There is an unusual shift to mildly battle-like imagery. The red petal of the shield and the aureolan armour of the beak. They are, at the same time, a literal description of the bird and an invocation of the strength of certain parental figures. For me, this is a possible inclusion of his mother by Hewitt, a testament to her endurance during the time of his father's illness. I base this notion on the words shimmying into her pond, wearing her mask. His mother's presence touches the pond of memory, wearing a brave face. Moving from those strong images, Hewitt introduces the concept of rebirth and renewal to the poem. The speckled eggs he speaks of are a perfect choice to represent the more hopeful tone of this poem. The more hopeful tone of this poem. The egg has been a symbol of life and renewal in countless cultures, from immortality in Russia and Sweden, to representing potential in Egyptian belief. In nature, it represents new life in the simplest terms. It is pictured among intervals of reed light, the choice of surroundings gives it an intensely idyllic quality. The nest and its eggs are perched on constant motion, a reminder to the reader that all things are in a constant state of change and flux. Even this perfect small scene of calm. The scale of the poem has drawn back to a much larger universal one. If the first half of the poem was the poet basking in the past with his father, then this one is the poet looking to a future without him. The great uncertainty of that kind of future is explored in the final lines of the poem. We cannot know the truth of water before we know its touch, its break, the tendrils of sun regathering. Never a stillness, the sky split from water, the nest from the image of the nest and the bird sliding across, picking twigs, an aerial shadow over the bed of the pond. It is only where the darkness travels that we picture depth, the silt 
and the truth of it. Hewitt abandons the personal I and invites the audience to ponder with him by changing the pronoun to we instead. Here, Hewitt's reverence for the natural world shines. And while I've talked about the romantic influence in his poetry already, the way he writes about it here really makes it something unique from those previous poets. The water described here is a thing brimming with mystery. However, the only way to understand it is to know its touch. Much like the only way to know the future is to live it. The water is given an agency all its own. Words like tendrils making it seem alive in itself. From here, the imagery of the poem runs riot in the dream state, as he waxes lyrical on the nature of water. He slips between the different forms of water in nature with a fluidity and ease that mimics the subject itself. This occurs in a physical sense at the same time, as the more we progress through the poem, the more each line bleeds into the next, leading the eye without choice quicker and quicker, like a running current. There is never a stillness to this poem, much like water, much like a dream. In two particular lines, there is a separation of the world as it is and the world as the poet wishes to perceive it. The sky split from water and the nest from the image of the nest. Here, the real world is contrasted with that of dream or idealization. It's an interesting contrast of vision and Hewitt is possibly hoping to understand his own emotions in this time of grief by grounding them in the natural world. Hewitt himself has written about the tradition of using the landscape to do exactly that. In an interview he once wrote, It's a strong tradition, speaking through a set of images or landscapes that seem to have an emotional or symbolic resonance. I've never lived in the countryside, although some of those nature poems seem to be taken as wild expanses. A lot of them are in my head. City parks, gardens, places that are not inaccessible to the majority of people. But I think we love our imagined landscapes too. I like to hear how people imagine the landscapes of the poems I thought about, a path or a park in Liverpool. The final lines of the poem make it clear just how much the natural world helps the poet to understand his own life. More than that, he wishes to allow others to do the same, encouraging them to engage with their own imagined landscapes. And the bird sliding across, picking twigs, an aerial shadow over the bed of the pond. It is only where the darkness travels that we picture depth, the silt and the truth of it. The darkness that the duck carries with it is paradoxical, as it reveals more than it hides. Its shadow shows the bottom of the lake, the silt and truth of it. Through these natural scenes, the poet has come to understand that we cannot truly appreciate the light without the darkness. Whilst this in no way softens the blow of the loss of his father, it does allow him to appreciate that better things may come after it. So. Why this poem? Frankly, it's one of the best elegies I've ever had the pleasure of reading. Honouring the dead in poetry is a long tradition, but one that's often plagued by ostentation and almost too much reverence. The old adage, don't speak ill of the dead, seems often to be the golden rule for many of them. Sean Hewitt avoids all those pitfalls deftly by crafting a poem centered around his own troubled emotions in the wake of his father's death. More than that, he turns to nature to make sense of those emotions. His father is honoured in a subtle yet strong fashion. That reverence is firmly grounded in sincerity, thanks to Hewitt's own recognition of the fallibility and fluidity of his memory. In a collection of poetry fused with the gothic and the natural, this poem stands out as a small beacon of hope. When we pass on, many of us can only wish to be written about in such a gentle and fond fashion as Hewitt has done here. What is your reading of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation, and as such, very much up for debate. 
If you've been enjoying my podcast, I would kindly ask you to leave a review of it wherever you listen. Or, better yet, send this on to a friend that might enjoy it. If you'd like to talk to me about anything in the episode, or if you'd like to suggest a poem for the podcast, you can reach me in a few ways. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. You can find my website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com, where you'll also find the show notes for this episode, complete with references to everything spoken about. If none of that suits you, I'm on Instagram. Just search Words That Burn Podcast. And there you can find helpful study guides and bonus content too. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode is by Sid Akiara and is used under Creative Commons license. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to me. And hopefully, you'll hear from me again soon.